The following audio is from a three-part presentation and interactive game with Dr. Roy Fleischman. This audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Novel Options and Patient Perspectives in Rheumatoid Arthritis, Individualizing Care for Therapeutic Success. To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash QCS. A printable transcript, slides, Practice aids and other features are also available. The overall approach to treatment of patients with RA depends upon the timely and judicious use of therapeutic interventions. It is also important to note that the treatment of RA should be based on a shared decision between patient and rheumatologist to reach treatment goals. The appropriate use of these therapies is based upon an understanding of a group of general principles that have been widely accepted by rheumatologists worldwide. These include early recognition and diagnosis of RA, care by a rheumatologist, early use of DMARDs for all patients, importance of tight control, utilizing a treat-to-target strategy with a goal of remission or low disease activity if remission is not possible, use of NSAIDs and glucocorticoids only as adjuncts to therapy, and understanding the patient's perspective on their disease and disease management. In a survey of almost 4,000 patients with rheumatoid arthritis in Europe, United States, and Canada, patients strongly agreed that setting goals was beneficial as it allowed them to assess treatment success and or made them feel more positive. 84% stated that quickly reaching the target was important, over 90% indicated having a good day as the preferred target. 88% felt it important to discuss goals with their HCP. 67% thought it would be helpful if their HCP provided examples. 73% stated that their HCP did not discuss setting targets, and 61% reported their healthcare provider did not manage their RA with strict goals and timeframes in place. It appears that what is required is a bridge between identification of patient-specific goals and how physician defined realistic treatment expectations. To better understand the patient perspective of treatment options and satisfaction with their care, as well as provide a unique component to this educational activity, an online survey of 100 adults with RA in the United States was conducted. Mean age was around 50, a little bit less than half were male. 95% saw a healthcare provider within the past year for their rheumatoid arthritis. 70% saw a rheumatologist and 30% a PCP. The current therapy was interesting. Almost 50% were in NSAIDs. Surprisingly, only 22% were a methotrexate, although 27% were on other conventional synthetic DMARDs. Only a third were on TNF inhibitor, but 10% were on another biologic DMARD or a targeted synthetic DMARD, including rituximab, a JAK inhibitor, ABA, or tocilizumab. Less than half felt their overall health was good, and 26% thought it was only fair and 7% poor. About half felt their RA has a moderate effect on their quality of life, and 15% felt it was extreme. Approximately 70% rated the severity of their RA as at least moderate, 60% have set treatment goals with their HCP. Patients were asked to rate the impact of RA on their quality of life using a scale where one was not significant at all, three was somewhat significant, and five was extremely significant. Here are the results. You can see that the worst were fatigue, tender joint count, and bodily pain. The patients felt that the HCPs had similar feelings with respect to what was involved. When asked to rate the level of satisfaction with their current RA treatment, almost 20% were extremely satisfied, about a third were satisfied, about a third were somewhat satisfied, 8% were not satisfied, and 2% were not satisfied at all. When asked how willing they were to try new treatment options for RA, only about 10% were not willing to change treatments. When asked to rate the impact of a variety of factors on treatment satisfaction, Patients responded that the ability to reduce joint pain and swelling and improvement in the ability to perform daily tasks were most important. 
When patients were asked about factors that would increase their willingness to try a new therapy for RA, improved efficacy was first followed by a favorable side effect profile and then a recommendation of their healthcare provider received the highest rankings. However, about 40% of patients indicated that not achieving treatment goals was a factor impacting their openness to new therapeutic options. When asked about actions from the healthcare providers that would improve adherence to therapy, two-thirds felt that keeping the regimen as simple as possible was important, a little bit over 50% said give clear instructions, about a third said involve me in my care through self-monitoring, 30% said increase visits if I'm not achieving my treatment goals. Additional actions suggested by patients to improve treatment adherence included providing them with educational materials and encouraging the support of family and friends. The treatment of rheumatoid arthritis must be based on a shared decision between the patient and rheumatologist. The primary goal is to maximize long-term health-related quality of life through control of symptoms, prevention of structural damage, normalization of function, and participation in social and work-related activities. Abrogation of inflammation is the most important way to achieve these goals. Treatment to target by measuring disease activity and adjusting therapy accordingly optimizes outcomes in RA. We have a practical algorithm based upon these updated recommendations, which was recently published in the Annals of Rheumatic Disease. You can see that the main target is remission, which should be sustained. And you use a composite measure of disease activity every one to three months. If you achieve remission, then you maintain the medication and assess the disease activity about every six months. If you lose remission, then you should adapt therapy. You always have to consider comorbidities and other patient factors when you're adding or discontinuing medication. The alternative target would be low disease activity if no matter what you do, you can't achieve a sustained remission or if the patient's comorbidities don't allow you to use certain medications. Reaching the therapeutic target of remission or low disease activity has improved outcomes in patients with RA significantly. But what tools are available for clinicians to assess whether individual patients have achieved this goal. If you see this chart, it's from uh, Arthritis Care and Research 2012, you can see that there are a number of metrics that one can use. The composite tools that include both patient and provider uh, metrics are the CDI, and which also incorporates laboratory, is the DOS28 ESR or CRP, or the SDI. Since remission is now defined by the ACR ULAR subcommittee as SDI remission, SDI is probably the preferred metric to use, although CDI is very, very close to SDI in, in terms of uh, correlation. So in practice, I use the CDI. But are clinicians actually measuring disease activity in clinical practice? This is a survey that was done by Jack Cush presented at the ACR annual meeting in 2014, which is very interesting. He did the survey in 2005, 2008, and 2014. And you can see the number of respondents was actually decreased in each of the three. Their mean age was 49 in 2005, and then you can see it increased to 58 uh, in 2014. And if you take a look at it, it's nine years, and the mean age increased nine years. Years in practice increase. You can also see that the percent that used TNF inhibitors, more than 50% in, in time, increased from 44% to 75% in 2014. So look at the results. They are interesting. In 2005, less than 20% of rheumatologists were using a hack or MD hack, about 6% of DOS28, and about 2% in ACR20. How you use an ACR20 in clinical practice is beyond me. Very few doctors, though, in 2005 were using metrics. By 2014, the use of these metrics increased. About a third were using a hack or MD hack. 27% were using a RAPID-3. And then about 16% were using a DOS-28 or a CDI, both of which are composite measures. So we've improved over the years, but we haven't improved enough. 
we can say that more than 50% of docs still don't use a measure of disease activity, but I would say that 80% don't use an effective composite measure of disease activity, which should be a CDI, an SDI, or worst case scenario, a DOS-28. And then, a survey was done in 2012 of approximately 100 US-based rheumatologists. And the question was asked is, why don't you measure disease activity? Almost two-thirds reported that the tools to measure RA disease activity are too time consuming. They take about a minute to do. About 50% reported that tools to measure RA disease activity are not easy to use, although you can do an SDI and a CDI in your head. 45% said they lack supporting staff which prevented frequent patient evaluations, although all it takes is asking a patient how they feel, adding what you think that they, how they feel, and doing a joint count. And 32% said the reliability and validity of tools to measure RE disease activity versus personal clinical experience have not been adequately proven, although it has time and time again. And about 30% said the selection of the appropriate tool to measure RE disease activity is too complicated, although you can select one of the three, and it's not that complicated. Though advances in treatment over the past 30 years have helped to improve outcomes, RA continues to present a considerable human and economic burden due to several unmet needs. First and foremost, the inability of all patients to achieve remission with the available therapeutic options utilizing our currently understood therapeutic targets. We can look at the pathogenic pathways in rheumatoid arthritis and the cell biology within the synovial tissue, which I'm sure you've all seen multiple times in the past. And all this cartoon de depicts is there are multiple cells and multiple immune mediators that are active in the activity of rheumatoid arthritis. And this then would present multiple targets which we can use to try to suppress inflammation effectively. So the current treatment options for rheumatoid arthritis include the conventional synthetic DMARDs, such as hydroxychloroquine, leflunamide, methotrexate, and sulfasalazine, a targeted synthetic DMARD, only tofacinib is available right now. It's an oral small molecule JAK inhibitor. There are five TNF inhibitor biologic DMARDs that are available, adalimumab, certolizumab, and tenercept, galimumab, and afliximab. And there are non-TNF biologic DMARDs, including abatacept, which inhibits T-cell activation via binding to CD80 and CD86, rituximab, which is a CD20-directed cytolytic antibody, and tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor antagonist. There are also emerging therapies for rheumatoid arthritis in phase three development, and several of them are probably going to be approved this year. Cerulimab is a human IL-6 receptor monoclonal antibody. Olakizumab is a human IL-6 monoclonal antibody. Cerucumab is a monoclonal antibody to IL-6, but not to the receptor. Embarasinib, pefacinib, ABT-494, and flagotinib, all are JAK inhibitors. So early in 2016, the 2015 ACR guidelines for the treatment of early RA were published. They divided the treatment into two spheres. One was disease duration of less than six months, and the other was disease duration of greater than six months. And you can see that in a DMARD-naive early RA patient, whether the patient has low disease activity or moderate high disease activity, start with DMARD monotherapy. If they still have moderate high disease activity, in other words, if they're not treated to target, then it's suggested that you can use a combination of traditional DMARDs or a TNF inhibitor or a non-TNF biologic. It's interesting to note that they said that if you use a TNF inhibitor or a non-TNF biologic, you can use the medication with or without methotrexate. We know, however, that biologic DMARDs do do better in combination with methotrexate. So only patients who cannot tolerate methotrexate or there is a contraindication to giving them methotrexate or another DMARD would one use a biologic as monotherapy. And then if you still have high disease activity, then you move to phase two, which is looking at patients with disease duration of greater than six months. And this, of course, makes sense because if you see a patient, it's six months from diagnosis. By the time the patient gets into you, 
it's probably going to be a month or two or three. And if you start with a, with a DMARD such as methotrexate, you're going to wait at least three months before you give up with methotrexate. So virtually all patients will actually be in the second part of the algorithm. So now, if you have a patient who is DMARD naive, you would treat the same way. If they still have disease activity, or if they failed methotrexate, then they suggest that you can use a combination of DMARDs. You can use a TNF biologic or non-biologic or tofacinib. And again, they talk about the biologics plus or minus methotrexate, but when you read the article, it says that only use the biologics as monotherapy if the patient cannot tolerate or has a contraindication to methotrexate. Tofacinib, of course, is approved as monotherapy or in combination with methotrexate. And then, if the patient doesn't respond with whatever you picked, then you adapt therapy. And it gets interesting, because if you did not pick a TNF as your first choice, the algorithm doesn't allow you to pick the TNF as a second choice, which, of course, we wouldn't in practice. Then there are combinations that they would suggest or not suggest. It's actually very complicated. But the simplistic way of looking at this is, is if the first medication doesn't work, and the patient doesn't achieve a significant decrease in disease activity in three months, you change therapy. So the treatment options available to patients with RA are ever-changing. And understanding the similarities and differences of efficacy and safety between the different therapies should be of key importance in order to facilitate treatment decisions by both the patient and the physician. Evidence for efficacy and treatment is often ascertained from registries and meta-analyses, which often do not sufficiently address the relative effectiveness of two medications. The best way of deciding which medication is effective or are the comparable is a head-to-head -head trial. So let's look at head-to-head -head studies of approved targeted therapies in RA. And this is the Accelerate study. So in this study, patients who were methotrexate incomplete responders were treated with either sertolizumab, pegol, or adalimumab, plus methotrexate. They were randomized one-to-one. -one. So as a patient's methotrexate incomplete responder start on either sertolizumab or adalimumab. And then the primary endpoint was at week 12, they had to have an ACR20 response. If they did not, and they were on sertolizumab, then they would switch to adalimumab, 40 milligrams every two weeks, plus methotrexate. If they were adalimumab, then they would switch to sertolizumab. When we look at the results of Accelerate, they are very interesting. Firstly, with respect to the primary endpoints, which were the ACR20 response at week 12, and the maintenance of low disease activity at year two, there was no difference between sertolizumab and adalimumab. There was no difference in safety as well. So either drug is effective, and they're equally effective. What was very interesting was the primary non-responders. So the primary non-responders were switched to the alternative TNF. And those patients, about 60%, had an ACR20 response. This would suggest that if a patient fails a TNF, has a primary non-responder, as opposed to conventional uh, wisdom on this, patients will respond to a second TNF as well as they will to a switch in mechanism of action. A second head-to-head -head trial compared abatacept to adalimumab, and it was a non-inferiority de design. So these patients had to have rheumatoid arthritis for less than five years, had to be methotrexate incomplete responders and biologic naive. They had to have disease activity with the DOS-28 CRP showing at least moderate disease activity. And they were treated for two years with either ABBA, 125 milligrams sub-Q each week plus methotrexate, or adalimumab, 40 milligrams sub-Q biweekly, again, plus methotrexate for two years. So the reason this study was done was it was originally thought that adalimumab would be more effective earlier than ABBA. But what are the results? So the results of ABBA were very interesting. One would have assumed that ABBA would have had a slower effect and not as effective as adalimumab. But actually, the effect was identical. Starting at week two, 
and out to year two. There was no difference in the clinical efficacy of ABBA versus adalimumab, both in combination with methotrexate. And when we looked at the safety findings, albeit a relatively small study, there was no difference in the safety between ABBA and adalimumab. And radiographic progression was exactly the same. So this head-to-head -head trial would then suggest that if a patient is in incomplete response to methotrexate, whether you treat with adalimumab or you treat with abatacept first, it doesn't make a difference. Either one in a group of patients will have equal efficacy. A very interesting trial is the RA beam trial. This is a head-to-head -head trial of baricitinib for biologic and naive RA patients with an inadequate response to methotrexate. And these patients were randomized in double-blind fashion to baricitinib, 4 milligrams a day, plus methotrexate, or adalimumab, 40 milligrams every two weeks, plus methotrexate, or to methotrexate, and then switching to baricitinib. So the results of RA beam were very, very interesting. What you can see here is that at week 12, 24, and 52, baricitinib was statistically superior to adalimumab in the ACR 20, 50, and 70 responses. They were both better than placebo at week 12 and week 24, but baricitinib was superior clinically at all time points. That was also true with respect to the SDI, CDI, and the DOS28 CRP or ESR remission or low disease activity. There was no difference in radiographic progression. And with respect to safety, there was no significant difference. This is a relatively small study. Uh, there were 400, 500 patients in a group, but that's not large. There was no difference in herpes zoster between the baricitinib group and the adalimumab group. So we think about the JAK inhibitors having an increased risk of herpes zoster. They do, compared to the normal population. But the TNF inhibitor, or in this case adalimumab, the risk is almost as high. So let's take a look at IL-6 itself. Because IL-6 is interesting, it plays a role in many of the systemic manifestations of RA. Lipid metabolism, systemic inflammation, it's an inducer of CRP, vascular endothelial dysfunction, it uh, changes hepcidin, it, it affects the osteoclast with generalized bone mineral density loss, and there can be autoantibody production. So a very interesting trial was the ADACTA trial. We know that there are patients in the real world who do not take methotrexate because they don't want to or because they can't. So this is looking at monotherapy, tocilizumab versus adalimumab in a powered head-to-head -head trial as monotherapy. We know that adalimumab does work better in combination with methotrexate. So in this study, patients were treated with tocilizumab, 8 milligrams per kilogram intravenously every four weeks, plus placebo, or adalimumab monotherapy every two weeks, plus placebo. And the primary endpoint was the change in the DOS28 at week 24. So the results of ADACTA are what we would have expected. We know that adalimumab works better with methotrexate. This showed that tocilizumab as monotherapy is superior to adalimumab when you look at the change in the DOS28 CRP. We might ask the question, why would a CRP be used to look at the difference? as tocilizumab as an IL-6 inhibitor should suppress CRP as it does in almost every patient. So maybe these results are not accurate. But if you look at the CDI, the CDI does not have a CRP. It has patient and physician global, as well as tender and swollen joint counts. And the results were identical when looking at the CDI. So this study did show that in patients who cannot or will not take methotrexate, if you have to choose a medication in a group of patients, you would be better picking an IL-6 inhibitor such as tocilizumab rather than adalimumab, although obviously some patients with adalimumab will have an effect as monotherapy. So there are several IL-6 inhibitors in development. So this is cerulimab, and it's monotherapy versus adalimumab. It's called the Monarch study. The results of Monarch are interesting as well because one would think that the results would be similar to ADACTA, the, the, the study that compared tocilizumab to adalimumab as monotherapy. And in this study, comparing cerulimab to adalimumab, the IL-6 inhibitor, cerulimab, 
is superior in groups of patients we're looking at the change of the DOS28 ESR or the DOS28 CRP compared to adalimumab. And when you look at the safety, uh, there were really no significant safety signals between cerulimab or adalimumab seen in this relatively small study of less than 200 patients each. There was a very small study that was done, which was called the Astroturin trial, uh, which looked at uh, the efficacy of tocilizumab versus cerulimab. So Astertain was a very small study, only 100 patients in a group, and uh, of the 100 patients in the cerulimab group, half were in 150 milligrams every two weeks, half were in 200 milligrams every two weeks, and it showed that there was no significant difference in the ACR20 response at week 24. This would suggest that the drugs are comparable. I doubt that we'll see a true head-to-head -head trial that's powered to show equivalence or superiority of IL-6 inhibitors. So this may be the only evidence that we have. But it's not surprising, as they both have the same mechanism of action, and we would expect both to be similarly effective. So what are the unmet needs in RA? Advances in treatment with targeted agents, together with early aggressive treatment and treat-to-target strategies, have significantly improved the clinical course and prognosis of RA, but sustained true remission is rare. It's achieved in only about 10% of patients if you look at Boolean or SDI remission. Many patients with RA have a need of information and want to be more actively involved in medical decision making and establishing treatment goals. So in conclusion, medical decisions in this population should focus primarily on the management of the disease with conventional synthetic or biologic DMARDs. When weighing the options, elements to consider include treatment efficacy, approximate time to benefit, possible side effects, current and future risks, cost effectiveness, route of administration, and impact on daily life. Given the preference sensitive element of these treatment options, treatment decisions are best accomplished when there is a shared decision between the patient and the rheumatologist. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME CE CPE activity, download materials, and complete the post test for instant credit, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash QCS. This educational activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals.